Again to the Bad Quaker Podcast, where liberty is our mission. Today is Monday, September 30th, 2013. My name is Ben Stone, and this is podcast number 350. Bitcoin Not Bombs Needs Your Help to Hoodie the Homeless. Mass Appeal Inc. has offered us a great deal on 324 discontinued orange hoodies that will be distributed to the homeless in San Francisco. We have until the end of October to raise 47 Bitcoin needed to reach our goal, and we're calling on the Bitcoin community to help us make this happen. You can pledge contributions to the Bitcoin starter campaign, you can purchase a Bitcoin Not Bombs t-shirt, or you can donate to Bitcoin Not Bombs directly. Every t-shirt sold is priced to pay for one hoodie to keep someone warm this winter. So go to bitcoinnotbombs.com and help us hoodie the homeless, or you can follow the links from badquaker.com. And with me today, uh, the triumphant return of Stephen Kinsella, patent attorney, uh, podcaster at Kinsella on Liberty. Uh, you can find his work over at the Center for Study of Innovative Freedom and the Libertarian Papers. And he is the author of one of three books that I will argue are a must-have for anybody that is serious about liberty. Uh, Anatomy of the State by Rothbard, little 60-page book. You need to have three or four copies laying around just to hand to somebody. Defending the Undefendable by Walter Block. You know, if you're a regular listener to this podcast, I don't agree with everything with Walter Block, but that is a great book. You need to have it on your shelf and be ready to just hand it to somebody as a gift. And the third book that you absolutely have to have, and again, it's only about 60 pages or so, is Against Intellectual Property. And there, if you haven't read it, uh, follow the links at badquaker.com, pick up the free PDF version, but one way or the other, get it on your shelf and have it handy just to hand to people. It's that valuable. Stefan, uh, thanks for coming back on the show, and welcome back to BadQuaker.com. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate that. And uh, it's also available, my book is in uh, EPUB format uh, for free online. And uh, I have some other books coming out, uh, one on libertarian legal theory, and one uh, maybe a, a, an expanded version of IP theme called uh, copy this book uh in, in press right now so that's the uh the working title there's other possible titles so uh and i prefer the title uh patent attorney extraordinaire so <laughs> if you could just kind of append that i would uh you know greatly appreciate it but um no this is great I, I like that uh you know we're into bitcoin and all these issues i'm speaking by the way this coming saturday <clears throat> at jeff tucker's Bitcoin related conference in Atlanta ah. called Crypto Cryptocurrency Conference, which you can find at cryptocurrencycon.com. Lots of great speakers and um it should be a lot of fun. So anyone interested, I think there's still openings available, but it's I think filling up quickly. So uh that's what's up with me. That's great to hear. I saw that and I thought, man, how am I gonna arrange to be in Atlanta in that time frame? And it just didn't quite work out, but uh but I'm. I wish I could have made it down there and listened to all you guys. You, you know, though, in reference to your book against intellectual property, I have spent uh, countless hours on the internet and in person trying to explain, trying to talk to people about IP, and trying to, you know, first off, there's so much misconception and there's so much misunderstanding about what's patent, what's copyright, what, you know, how these laws work and how the state enforces them all on us and everything. There's so much misunderstanding and confusion in this. And I've gotten to the point of where when the conversation starts, I, I stop and I say, look, do you, have you ever read the book Against Intellectual Property? And if they say no, I don't argue anymore. I just say, yeah. when you read that, then we'll talk. 
uh, because if they're not willing to take, you know, what does it take? A couple hours to read it. If they're not willing yeah, to, it's, to it's, put, it's pretty short. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty short. And, and I, I feel like I don't even need to talk to them if they're not willing to put out that much effort. Well, what baffles me is that people have these very strong opinions, um, and they seem like they're sincere people. And I understand this is a difficult issue. It's confusing. Um, but if you have very, very strong opinions and you just you know talk about things that you really don't understand, and like you say, th- these people don't even understand copyright, patent, trademark, trade secret, or the differences. That, you know, they 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 they, uh, they use the word plagiarism a lot in part of their arguments. So. Look, they're trying to figure this out, and I appreciate that, but it's like they're trying to reinvent the wheel while having a strong opinion about the way things should be. They're supporting a regime that they either don't understand or that they're mis- misrepresenting. Right? Um, to my mind, you should be a little bit more humble about these issues. They are very confusing and difficult, partly because of the propaganda the state has managed to to spread. So if you stop and you know step back and think about these issues – and try to figure out really what's the essence of what they're arguing for here, then the libertarian position emerges. It's a little bit dissonant for some people to accept it because it's it's contrary to what they've the way they've been thinking about it for for decades. Um, so a little humility is required on this topic. It's one of the most difficult topics. It's not the most important. I'd say it's number five or six on the scale of horrible things the state does. You know, it's behind. Educational propaganda and the drug war and war and taxation, perhaps, and you know central banking, but it's right up there next to those guys, and uh, it's one of the most insidious ones because, unlike the others, it goes under the guise of property rights, and a lot of libertarians accept that it's property right. So um, I think libertarians should stop asking questions as an argument. They can ask questions if they want. But what you'll what you'll see quite often is if you just say you know I don't I think there's a problem with patent or copyright, then the response isn't a serious question or a response. It's usually a question framed as a response, or vice versa. So they'll say, well, how would authors get paid for you know rewarded in a free society? And the premise of that question is that unless you can show me a guaranteed way. For people to get paid for doing things that I think need, they need to do, I'm going to have to support statism, which is like welfareism, right? It's like saying, unless you can show me that voluntary charity in a free society would be sufficient to make sure that there's no poor people anywhere, then I have to support uh, taxation and redistrib- redistributionism and welfare. It's really the same thing, this whole attitude. That's a really good point, and I think it's something that we fall into really easily, not just about this topic, but, you know, it can be like, you know, who will build the roads or whatever. There's just so many ways that we can fall into that same mental trap where we have to make a complete ground up defense of every single aspect of life, you know, in order to say, well, really, if you just think about it. How does a family interact? Well, how does, how does a voluntary group interact? Does, if you go, if you're a church member, you attend a church, um, is, is, you know, are, are these things, uh, the functions of your church group, are those inflicted by law where they will come and arrest you if you don't do those things? Of course not. Uh, or if you don't attend a family reunion, will they send the family reunion police out and, you know, and capture you and put, and of course not. And But our minds have a tendency, because like you were saying, we've been brainwashed for so long, our minds have a tendency to, to demand that every single possible avenue be explained before you step out and say, okay, well, maybe this stuff will work. Yeah, and I, I think that um, um, libertarians sort of lose track of the history of the ideas that got us to where we are, so – where we're used to framing things in a certain way, and in a way they're unnecessary now. So, you know, John Locke was responding to basically defenses of monarchy. So you had these people that were arguing that monarchies were legitimate. Why are they legitimate? They're legitimate because God created the universe and owns everything and gave the entire earth in trust to the original inhabitants, which is Adam and Eve. Okay, so you could imagine, you could trace that down and say, Adam owns the entire earth. 
Okay, and then that flows from him to the monarchs that existed in the you know sixteen sixteen hundred, let's say, in Europe, fifteen, sixteen hundreds. So it was basically this kind of bizarre idea that there's property in common and that's used as a defense of monarchy. So then John Locke, who's sort of our intellectual father for all libertarians, comes along and he's trying to fight this, but he uses similar language. So he says, Yes, okay, God gave us the earth. But he says in commons. Now, not really owned. He's not really clear about that. So it, in commons, but it's sort of unowned and unused. And so the first guy that starts using a piece of property gets to own it. But when he says this, he uses the word labor. He says, well, if you own yourself, then you own what you do with yourself, which is labor. And so then you own things that you create with your labor. So his entire attempt was an attempt to – have a natural rights or natural rights, you know, defense of liberty. Um, that, that's my poodles, excuse me. That, um, uh, that was a rebuttal to Filmer and the defenses of monarchy. Okay. But he wasn't really, he was just talking about things owned in common as a counterpoint to the previous paradigm being used to defend basically statism and feudalism. Okay. But you don't really need to literally believe that we own our labor to make this defense. Locke did that because of the circumstances of the time. But we get locked into this mode of reasoning, and everyone starts thinking, well, Locke has shown, and the libertarian project depends upon the idea that we own our labor, and we own, quote-unquote, whatever we create. So if you start thinking in these terms, then it's easy to get confused and to engage in either intentional or unintentional equivocation and come up with arguing that, well, if I come up with an idea that's useful, well, I created it, so I must own it because there's a general principle, I own what I create. So we have to step back and realize, look, that was never really the justification for libertarianism. It wasn't about owning what you create. Okay, that was really just an objection to feudalism and monarchy and statism. Really, the idea is that the the world is unowned and there are things in it that are unowned, and that people that first start using these things have a better claim than others. But they they don't really literally create this matter that they homestead. They simply use it first. And they embroider this thing. That gives them a better claim than others. It's really got nothing to do with ownership of labor. Or owning what you create. It's owning what you first embroider as a scarce resource. And if you get that clear in your mind, this is why when you brought up the IP thing, I mean this was never my favorite issue. Uh, but it's become in a way a very important issue because to understand the IP issue, you have to get straight in your own mind uh, basic property concepts, basic principles of justice and justification, contract. Things that are really fundamental to the libertarian uh, project, and those things are easy to do intuitively when you're dealing with physical property. But when this IP stuff comes into it, you really have to step back and revisit and uh, and get it straight in your own mind. And that's what the IP issue has kind of forced me to do. And um, it's I think it's been um, it helpful to my own understanding of uh, the basics of libertarianism and justice. Uh, whenever I talk to somebody on these topics, and the word justice comes up. I always uh, I, I, I try to catch myself and make sure that I kind of examine that word a little bit because it it, it almost is like um, it's almost like one of these words that can be adjusted and made to mean whatever the government wants it to mean in a particular time, and that's caused a distortion as to the true meaning of justice. I mean, you know, uh, let's let's say for example, well, let's put it this way. Um, I think there's a certain intuitive tendency within a lot of mammals, because I've seen this with dogs and I've seen this with other mammals as well, not just humans, but we see inequality taking place or we see something that is clearly not fair. And, and, I, and you don't have to sit down with a committee and a series of rules and write it all out to figure out, hey, there's something happening here that's not quite right. And somebody has to have something restored or there has to be some kind of retribution in order to make this right again. And this is where, you know, you start thinking about justice. If somebody robs you, they steal your wallet and they run away. 
if that person gets caught down the street by a cop, the cop takes them in, puts them in a cage, puts them in front of a judge. They talk to an attorney. They go through the whole process. They go to jail. They spend a year in jail. Was justice ever done in that? Because you you were robbed, and you may or may not have gotten your money back, but really what experience happened when you were robbed? Did you ever really have the the problem satisfied? And I, and I think a lot of times when we refer to justice, I think that brainwashing you were referring to earlier twists the argument to a certain extent. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I've thought a lot about this issue. I mean, the original concept of justice, uh, if you think of uh, the Roman times, the idea of justice is giving someone their due. Now, that's a general idea, but it really means what they're entitled to. It sounds a little circular, but if you think about it closely – Justice hinges upon property rights because what you're due depends upon what your property rights are, right? Now, perfect justice, to my mind, means people respect each other's rights. That is, the just solution is reached when, when there's a dispute over a scarce resource and if people come together in a cooperative fashion and they, uh, they, they have a, a discussion or a discourse about it and they come up with a reasonable way of allocating who gets to use this thing. That's justice. Now, in a secondary sense, what happens when these rules are breached? Because we have to keep in mind that there's a difference between fact and value or between descriptive causal physical laws and moral laws, right? So one is norms or things that you say specify what you should do, what rules people should follow, and the other is factual laws about the universe, now, it's really literally impossible to violate a causal law. You cannot violate the law of gravity, for example, uh, or even the law of supply and demand in economics. But you can violate the law or the rule that says you should not commit aggression. So because people have free will and they choose, there's a difference between prescription and description. A prescription is a law that prescribes what you should do versus law that describes what is the case – in terms of causal laws. So then we have the question, well, if justice is served perfectly when people obey or abide by the exercise of their free will, by these normative rules that we all pretty much agree with, you shouldn't hurt other people, you shouldn't even be dishonest or cheat people or invade their property, um, what happens when they do violate that? Because they can. Unlike physical laws, they can violate these laws. So to my mind, justice really in a practical human sense is dealing with the second order of question of what do you do in response to an act of, let's say, injustice or an act of aggression? And I think we have to realize, first of all, that except in very simple cases, it's really impossible to uh, restore the status quo ante. That is to that is to give someone what we call restitution, perfect restitution. So if you are murdered <laughs> – you know, even if you catch the guy and he's punished or he has to pay restitution, the victim doesn't get his life back. He's still dead. Okay? If someone is severely aggressed against or battered, raped, whatever, that can't be undone. And in fact, this is one reason why it's important to be libertarians because we, we recognize in, intuitively you cannot undo an act of injustice. Okay? So in a way, justice is, is impossible. If you, if by justice you mean undoing the crime, it's really impossible. As a practical matter, the only question is, what rights does the victim have in the aftermath of an undoable act of injustice? They're going to be imperfect no matter what. We have to recognize that, which is one reason we have to first and foremost be against aggression because once it's committed, there's no way to undo it. So any justice that we can achieve would be imperfect. Any amount of restitution paid is always going to be imperfect. You know, even if uh, aggressors were rich people, which are not, <laughs> and even if they were able to pay a billion dollars damages for every act of crime they committed, even that would be insufficient to undo the damage in most, in almost every case. Uh, almost every victim of crime, a violent crime, let's say, would prefer for the crime not to have happened. But that's impossible. That's not a choice on the table. So we can't choose a standard of justice that is un infeasible, but we have to recognize that it is imperfect in that sense. Um, so then we're left with what can we do to restore some kind of order 
to get things back on track, to maybe give the the, uh, the aggressor a chance to reincorporate himself back into society, you know, to be uh, rehabilitated, let's say. Um, and I think that's why the older systems of uh, paying some kind of restitutionary award, even though the, n- the amount is arbitrary and even though the amount is never going to be really sufficient to undo the crime, is really the only choice that practical humans have if they want to uh, deal with these occasional um, you know, voluntary acts of crime. So to my mind, justice is determining what the victim has the right to do as an imperfect remedy in response to a crime. That's what justice is really about, recognizing that it's imperfect, recognizing that there are certain social and practical constraints on – you know, you can't just go kill everyone for every minor infraction, and what good would that do anyway? So we have to work with the community, what neighbors want, with – you have to have some measure of mercy. There's just no way around it. You know, it's the, uh, it's, it's, it's the, what's the parable with Jesus and the, uh, the prodigal son, right? In a sense, the, the people that cause the most problems always get the most break. But that's the way it has to work. You know, charity has to go from the people that are successful to the people that are not successful for whatever reason, whether it's voluntary or just misfortune or whatever. So in my mind, justice is trying to make sure the victim can do whatever they can in a social context to achieve some measure of satisfaction, even though we recognize that they will never, never really truly be made whole. And if we contrast that to the current system we have under government, uh, you know, government aggression and, and the, the rules of the state and so forth, the what is sold to us as justice is actually always just more aggression. It's never actually justice. It's always, I mean, there might be some, you know, there might be some uh, fund or you might be able to sue somebody and get some kind of monetary gain back. But ultimately, the current uh, system of, uh, of law enforcement and justice and so forth is all based on aggression because ultimately the victim and people who are completely disassociated with the, with the event altogether are still forced to have to pay for all right. the processes involved. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, look, there, there are various theories of what's called punishment or retribution and uh, w- why we have the right or what's the, what's the function of um, having a justice system, a criminal justice system that uses force in some way against these malefactors, the bad people. And one theory, of course, is um, – Retribution, just to get revenge, you know, just to get justice, people call it, you know, so if someone kills you, your family member, you execute them. Now, it's not clear what the good that does. Maybe in some cases it gives the family member's victim, the victim, the family member of the victim, some kind of emotional, uh, healing. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm not so skeptical to say that they never get that. But so retribution is one purpose. Rehabilitation is another. That is, you're trying to make the criminals better. Uh, incapacitation is another. That's keeping them from preventing other crimes. Now, in my mind, as a libertarian, I am very skeptical of the entire idea of institutionalized coercion. I tend to believe that some kind of voluntary ostracism system along the lines of the law merchant, let's say, would tend to be more practical and more just in the long run uh, because really there's a big benefit to being part of society. And if you want to buy by the rules voluntarily – you know, um, uh, another would be just uh, you know pure self defense during the act itself. So I would tend to think that incapacitation is the most justifiable form of, of this sort of basically slavery. That is, if someone has proven themselves to be such a danger and a menace to society, you only have a few choices: you either let them keep doing it, or you ban them to some Coventry, as Heinlein called it, you know, basically Australia, you know, a penal colony. Um, or you kill them, or you put them in shackles forever, incapacitation. So you can actually understand that that's actually not punitive. It's just self-defense. It's preservative. Um, I don't. I, I still agree with you. It's not justified because this whole system is perverse. Because there's no rehabilitation. There's no rehabilitation. Right? Criminals tend to gain criminal skills in prison and lose. You know, productive skills, 
So they just come out as even more violent criminals at the other end. So there's no rehabilitation. Um, and the victims have to pay taxes along with you and I to keep these guys incarcerated. So we're being victimized twice. Um, so except for incapacitation, there's almost no good being done by prison. And, of course, nine-tenths of the prisoners are not even real criminals. They're just people that violated arbitrary state rules drug criminals, etc. They're not real criminals. Um, if you know, if the jails consisted only of murderers, robbers, and and uh, rapists, we might have a little bit less of an issue with saying we have to use some of our resources to keep these guys in jail just to protect ourselves from them. You know, that's the capacitation, incapacitation function of prison. Um, but to delude ourselves that these guys are being rehabilitated Right, or that there's really any justice being served by taxing the victims twice to pay for the housing of their aggressors uh, makes no sense uh, whatsoever. It's completely uh, uh, corrupted, quote, justice, unquote, system. You know, this is kind of maybe going off in an odd direction, but, um, you know, you see how the government fails at, at this one simple task. And then we, as libertarians, we often uh, realize that that's what the government tends to do. They tend to take on something, make it far more complicated than it needed to be, put layers and layers of bureaucrats in the middle, utilize aggression as its only method, and then fail in the long run. And so we see that not just in the justice system, but we see it, you know, in whatever whatever they want to do. We, we can make the argument about, uh, you know, going to the moon or space exploration or whatever. Sure, the government decides it wants to do something that mankind maybe ought to do, but then it's going to cost 500 times more for the government to do it. They're going to take, you know, way longer and they're not going to really accomplish anything when they get it done. They're not going to accomplish anything that's of any, you know, significant value. And that, when, when we see the government failures on each level like this, in a sort of a weird perverse way, in my mind, I think, you know, we need government to do more stuff so that it will display to everybody what a failure it is. And I know that's that's almost backwards thinking, but in another way, it, it, it's kind of like, um, you know, if, if we could just give more things over to the government to let them fail with, then would people see, then would people understand that, that this, you know, this aggression-based system can't work at anything it tries? I... I, I... <sighs> I'm skeptical of that because I think that people have – the government has been successful. They're good at a couple of things. The state is good at a couple of things. I mean it's very inefficient. It's very corrupt, but it's good at two things, destruction and propaganda. Or rather for propaganda, it's good at uh, going along with the modern trends spread by certain you know, people in its corner, certain intellectuals. Um, so the, the state relies upon the confusion of the people who, after all, have lives to live and jobs to to work, and they don't have a lot of time always to analyze these things. So the state plays upon the decent intu intuitions and values of the people. So you know, most people think that crime is bad, and we have to stop it as much as we can. And if they accept the idea that it's either the state or nothing – you know, either the state is the way to do this or nothing. Yes, we they understand that the state makes mistakes on occasion and convicts an innocent guy on occasion. But what's the, what's the alternative to never put anyone in jail? You know, if they, so they're thinking it's either chaos or nothing. And the state is there; it's imperfect, but that's the only way we can address this big problem in society. So the state is successful in distracting people and making them think that. The big problem is private crime. You know, and I, I don't know the quantity. I don't know how to measure this. Maybe private crime is a bigger problem than the state in some senses, or maybe it has been in times in the past. But the state is also a criminal, and it uses people's fear of private crime to gain legitimacy and to take control, right? So if it looks like it's doing the best it can, given realities, to stop private crime, People will let it get, get away with a lot of public crime, which in the end is, of course, much worse in extent and in magnitude um, than private crime. It's more insidious. It's more inescapable. I mean, Lysander Spooner has a great quote about this. He talks about 
he contrasts the uh, distinction between a highwayman, like a you know a robber on the side of the road, and the state. And at least he says the highwayman is honorable in the sense that he doesn't pretend he's not robbing you. Number one, and he leaves you alone after he's robbed you. It's a one-time thing, right? And he really doesn't want to kill you. Usually, he just wants to take your money and he goes on his way. Um, the state is completely uh, worse in almost every dimension because the state is pervasive. It follows you around. It imposes harms on you that don't even benefit the state in a lot of ca cases. This is what Rothbard talks about in his distinction between bi uh, triangular intervention right, and bilateral intervention. Some things the state just imposes costs on you not for its own benefit even, just because – they want to control what you can do. Um, so the state is much, much more of a serious enemy, but people have bought into this idea that it's the only organized way for society to counter private crime. So this is a major problem that we have to face. I, I'm not confident of the what you call what, – what some of us call the worse is better strategy, like the worse things get, the better they'll get, right? Like let's let them fail. And then finally the state will be revealed to be the charlatan fraud that it is. I mean you've had the collapse of communism. You've had so many state failures, and yet people still cling to it because they have no option in their minds. They can't see any option other than the state. So until that changes, and I'm not sure how that can change, I don't think that we should hope for um, – this kind of worse is better strategy to succeed. I need to cut us off there and throw in a commercial and uh, folks stick, stick with us. We'll be right back. Get over to sonsoflibertymint.com right now. Secure your wealth by trading in those pesky Federal Reserve notes for Sons of Liberty Mint's fine silver quarters. These one quarter ounce bars, square in shape and stamped trust in yourself, are unlike any other traditional round. With four pieces per ounce, you'll not only be investing in sound money, but you'll also be purchasing usable, divisible silver. Don't get stuck with ferns or bulky silver bars. Visit sunsoflibertymint.com today and invest in silver you can use. Energy, vitality, clarity of mind, and incredible immune support. The awesome power of nature is now in your hands. Hi, this is Sean from One With Nature. Our herbal formulas contain some of the greatest botanicals from around the world, and they are ready and willing to help you achieve your goals. Visit us at onewithnature.com. That's W-O-N, withnature.com. How would you like to do something to support BadQuaker.com? Here's how easy it is. If you're already going to buy something from Amazon, go to BadQuaker.com first. Click on any of the buttons for Amazon. Once at Amazon, shop like you normally would. You'll pay the same price for the things you buy from Amazon, but Amazon will give BadQuaker.com a tiny portion of that purchase. It's amazingly easy to shop at Amazon. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be supporting BadQuaker.com. Thank you. And thanks for sticking with us through the break. Ben Stone with the Bad Quaker Podcast and Stefan Kinsella. Um, you know, before the break, uh, you were hitting on something over and over there that is, uh, kind of <laughs> I hate to say, near and dear to my heart because it's just the opposite. It's something that I detest. But, it, but it's something that is on my mind a lot and I think about. And just this morning, I was uh, doing a little bit of looking around on the Internet and I saw... A, um, a story that Wired is carrying that the state of California is going to start teaching, uh, essentially it's start, it's going to teach anti-piracy, uh, propaganda to elementary schools starting with the second grade this year and eventually going out from kindergarten to sixth grade. And this is being backed up by, um, who is this? The California School Library Association. The Internet Keep Safe Coalition. Ooh, that just makes me shiver. And uh, the Coalition of the Center for Copyright Infringements, whose board members include executives from the MPAA, the RIAA, Verizon, Comcast, AT&T, and so forth and so on. And really it is, 
you know, it is propaganda given to us from the earliest ages. And, and it's getting the, if you can say it this way, the state is actually getting better at, at, at brainwashing and at propaganda and so forth. And that's really the scary part in this, I think. I agree. And it's a, it's a mystery to me why the, because the state is incompetent at almost everything it does, right? So the question is, why is it good at destruction? Well, it's good at destruction, and I say this because in my mind, I always think there's only two things the government is good at, the state. I should say the state, not the government. Um, because in my mind, I distinguish between government and the state. Government to me means the governing institutions of society, like uh, law, justice, order, defense, um, which have been co-opted by the state and which we now identify with the state, just like we identify roads with the state, but which don't have to be part of the state. Um, so you could be an anarchist or against the state without being against government or order or liberty or justice or law or roads. Um, but in any case, so the state um, uh, has infiltrated itself into these areas, right? And it has – for some reason, it is – Really bad at everything except for destruction and propaganda. Now, it's good at destruction, I believe, because destruction is easy. It's easier to destroy a building than to build it. I mean, the people that took down the towers in 9-11, uh, it costs a lot less money to do that than to build them, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, even if you think <laughs> George Bush did it, <laughs> which I don't believe, <laughs> uh, I think it was, you know, crazy Muslim terrorists uh, called me crazy, but whatever. Um, but propaganda, I think the government is good at it because it just piggybacks onto an inherent tendency of, of humans to specialize, right, and to focus on what their interests are, and they leave certain areas to the experts. So the government piggybacks upon this um, and takes advantage of it. So it is sad that people buy into this. Um, I don't know if the government's getting good at it or better at it. I tend to think they're getting better and worse at it over time in some ways. Um, I always think that the fall of Soviet communism in, the, in 1991 or so um, was a big teaching moment for humanity. Um, people haven't really read a lot more Hazlitt or Bastiat. They're not a lot more economically literate than they used to be, but there's a lot more awareness now, even among, let's say, Democrats in America, that we need capitalism, right? We need it as the engine of growth, that Soviet centralized communism cannot work. So just the fall of communism, just empirical evidence, just history, just experience can lead to – the evolution of knowledge, despite the state's attempts to co-opt it. Um, so my only hope for humanity, to be honest, is that gradually over time, the success of freedom, right, and liberalism and technology and capitalism will gradually leach into people's minds and they will uh, – I mean, yeah, there's going to be people that will learn it systematically, right? But I don't know if I can blame the state for people's ignorance. I just think it's apathy or it's specialization or it's just a natural um, situation where they just don't need to learn this. So they have no incentive to. So they go with the prevailing trends. Um, so my hope is that the, over time, technology and the market prevail despite the, the attempts of the state to, 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 to quash it. And, um, and the, the state diminishes in – Legitimate, you know, legitimacy and in scope over time. That's my only hope as a uh, somewhat cynical libertarian. I can't remember exactly where I read this. I'm fairly certain that the first time I encountered it was in something that Rothbard was, you know, one of Rothbard's works. Um, but but the thought is that um, if you have, and it's kind of along the the lines of the of the economic uh, uh, um, uh, thing that's called regulatory capture. It's where um, you ha you have one group, let's say a, a corporation or a one group of corporations that have a vested interest in the government doing a specific thing for them, 
And it may be that like 98% of the public might be against something like this. But because this tiny percentage of people that work for these this group of corporations or maybe this one corporation or maybe this just one billionaire or whatever, because it's so important to them, they're able to put a lot of resources into getting the government to do right. what they want. Whereas most people don't want that to happen, but they just can't take time out of their daily life because it's not really – that one issue is not really that important to them. Yeah, I think that's the public choice idea that um, vested interests have an incentive to pool their resources and to focus on a given issue, whereas the opposition may be larger, but it's more diffuse. And so there's no organized opposition, so these things you know, you know get passed. Um but there seems to be some loose feedback in the other, in other direction because of democracy or because of public opinion or because of increasing economic literacy or just because the Internet makes people aware of the blatant hypocrisy. So there's certain limits on this. And we have to remember, too, that the government, the state is a big fiction, and even, even the people that work with the state are deluded by its lies. So you know, politicians and bureaucrats… They're somewhat deluded. They don't want to think of themselves as members of the mafia, right? They don't want to think of themselves as um, just complete naked agents of state power. So they buy into the myths the state propounds to justify and legitimize itself. So you know that's why a cop might give a break every now and then or might try to be fair in a certain occasion when pure economics would say, why is this Nazi goon giving me a break? It makes no sense. It's because he's not a completely bad person, and he has been deluded himself into the myth of the state. And I think most government functionaries have been, right? That's why we appeal to the Constitution, even though I'd say you and I probably don't believe the Constitution is even legitimate. But we might say, listen, if you're sitting here lording it over us, and you claim that your authority is based upon your adherence to this Constitution, this holy document, then if you're not adhering to it, then… Uh, you're violating what you said, and you need to do it. So you're appealing to their own declared set of norms. So I think that's our strategy going forward. We have to appeal to the basic human decency of people that the state appeals to when it ensnares them into this delusion, right? Because they cannot just ask for goons. They can't say, if you're a goon, sign up here. We're going to shoot innocent people. No, they don't do that. It's more insidious than that. So it makes it more of a challenge, but it gives us an opening to, which is, or at least that's my hope. Yeah, I think if you keep what, what you just said, I think if you keep that in mind too, it, it becomes easier to not just turn to blind hate toward people who work for the government in one sense or another. Uh, I think, you know, there's a, there's so many people right now that are frustrated with all of the oppression and frustrated with the TSA and frustrated with the NSA and frustrated with all these different things that are going on or whatever the one thing is that's oppressing them in their life. And a natural, well, maybe not natural, but a, but a, a quick, easy reaction to that is to blame a whole class of people, to blame all those government workers, to blame, you know, the mailman, the, the, the bureaucrats at the, at the, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the license bureau, whatever it is in whichever state. And it's a little harder, but it's more realistic to realize that that mailman or that bureaucrat down there that's just stamping papers and, and hates their job as much as anybody else, uh, they're as much victims of this whole myth as the rest of us. Yeah, no, I agree completely. I mean, we have to have some sympathy for these people. I mean, look, if, it, if push comes to shove and people take certain jobs, you know, border guards or Guantanamo guards or concentration camp guards or, you know, the, the guards at prisons that keep drug people in, I mean, you can have less and less sympathy for that. And if it push came to shove, you know, if, if you're in jail and you had a way to escape and you had to kill someone to escape if it's between you and him you might have to make that choice but at a certain point we have to realize that there's a big popular delusion that's being spread by the whole state and by the whole state apparatus um i'm reading right now a really good book by martin van Crevel called the rise and decline of the state and he argues that the state 
is a modern institution. It's only been around for, say, three, two, three, four hundred years. Before that, it was not, it didn't have its corporate status that it has now. It didn't have a personality that was independent of the functionaries or the administrators of the state. So, and, you know, at a certain time in the past, in a certain region, you actually had a chance of killing the sovereign and changing policy because there's a king, right? Or at least you could say, I'm going to be a supplicant of the king. I'm going to say, king, would you please do the following? And maybe you succeed, maybe you don't. But if you succeeded, he actually might change the policy. But nowadays in democracy, there's no chance of that because Obama and these guys are just – Temporary. They come and go. Mm -hmm. The state corpus survives despite these guys. These guys are trivial and insignificant. The state has a sort of momentum of its own, right? An existence of its own. It exists independent of the people who come in and out and fulfill some of its duties. And in fact, I would say politicians are just window dressing for what's really going on. The, the, the bureaucracy and the administrative agencies really are the bulk of what's going on with the state, and they're going to continue their existence no matter what. So we have to view the state as an entity that has its own interest, and we have to stop deluding ourselves that you can affect its nature by electing a new politician like Bush instead of Obama or whatever. It won't make a difference. I mean these guys are no different anyway, and even if they were, they're only in for two or three or four years, right? I mean – and the next guy's going to come in. Next time, anyway. And if you're too radical, you're going to be killed, and or eliminated, or or, or just or weakened. So we have to focus on the state as an entity that is our enemy, but not on the individuals that fill some of the temporary positions that it makes available to buy support. That's uh, really interesting that you said that about the about the modern state because I I felt like. Um I felt like the modern state as we know it today was birthed in a three-part birthing process in around 1600 when the birth of modern corporations married with government and uh, and began the whole um, you know uh, corporate corporate marriage with government and then right. around the time that the United States was born this whole idea began to catch on of having well really before that with parliamentary actions in the 1500s but but really uh you know in the 1700s and early 1800s this idea of democracy and so, and and that a multi-headed government not a single-headed government was the answer and then i think the third aspect of the birth of the modern state was when um the corporate Banking interests finally got a hold of the monetary system completely around the turn of the 19th to 20th uh, uh, century. Um, yeah, I, 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 th I think that um, um, one of the most interesting things is to analyze modern history and to see that uh, something happened around 1800, right? We have the Industrial Revolution. Things start advancing rapidly. And the problem is we have this correlation versus causation problem. That is, we have a strange phenomena that exists to this day. We, li we live in gr vastly greater times in terms of material prosperity, etc., than in olden days. And the question is, what caused this to happen? Was it just inevitable? Was it just our time in history? Or did something cause it? So you'll hear some people say that, well, it coincided with the rise of America. Okay, or the West, or the Enlightenment. Um, some say that property rights increased, although there's r little evidence to show that property rights really got stronger after, let's say, 1800. They were they've been there for hundreds of years in kind of the same form. Um, some say that it was the patent and copyright system, the intellectual property law of America, that drove the Industrial Revolution. Although there's no strong evidence for this other than correlation. Um, so we have to find a way to explain this, right, and to explain the state's role in it. Is, is the state causing it? Is it is it a cooperative cooperative partner or is it hindering things? I think our view is that it hinders things, right, and that things would have been even better without it. But that's a hard case to make when people see what we have now compared to the way it's always been. They just assume certain things about the infrastructure 
that led to what we we have now. And they associate the state with infrastructure. Ha, your talk about the, the way state the state co-ops banking and these things. Hans Hermann Hoppe has a really good article from the 90s on banking states and national politics or international politics. He talks in detail about how the government of the state systematically co-ops different institutions of, of life, civil life, money, you know, uh, banking, uh, law, justice, defense, roads, education, and how it gradually becomes the guarantor of all these things in people's minds, which is why I mentioned earlier that, you know, if you think of a road, you think of the government. That's, that's how people think nowadays. I mean, and the road is the most unpolitical thing of all. It's just a, a piece of property with pavement over it. This is a way to pass from one place to another. But everyone thinks of this as a government function. Okay, so it's no surprise they think of law and justice and order uh, and uh, things like this as government functions. So this is our challenge that we have to debunk the myth of the state. The, that the state is competent, that it has our interests in, in mind. Um, Hoppe told me one time he thought that one of the most important things you can do is to laugh at the state, like have comedians, you know, people that joke at the state's expense. They don't take it seriously. So in a way, comedians and irreverent people are among our biggest allies because they – are the biggest challenges to state rule, in a, at least in a non-totalitarian society like we have now. I've, I've seen a tendency among people who are very, very, very serious statists who really uh, openly and blatantly uh, believe that, you know, essentially state the state is God. Without it, we would all be just sitting in the mud eating worms. And, you know, um, among people like that, my personal experience is very few of them have a sense of humor. Uh, a sense of humor is really, I think, more related to a certain level of uh, of activity in the brain that, that enjoys freedom and enjoys the ability to think in ways that we're told not to think. Could, yeah, could, I think it's it, – yeah, go ahead. I, I was just going to add because in a sense, all humor kind of has a naughty aspect to it. Or some kind right. of a surprise to it that you're not you're shocked by, or you you didn't expect, or you know something like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's irreverent. Um, it's not just humor; it's also tolerance. Um, I've always pointed this out, and I've never gotten a good answer from a statist. And the question is, why are statists so upset by us? Right. So if you think about it, I think you and I would switch positions tomorrow with statists if we could. We would be part of the dominant majority of society, like let's say 90% of all humans were, were libertarians, and there's a small carping minority of, of socialists and, and unionists and welfareists who are bitching about it, but they, they can't impose their will on us. I think you and I would accept that deal. I don't, I don't, I, all I want is a free society. I really don't mind if these guys complain about it because they can't do anything with force because that's the dominant mode of society. But the tables are turned now. Okay, they have actually, in a, in a sense, won. Right. So you and I are arguing with some typical welfare liberal or mainstreamer, and they want the government to be in control. Well, the government is in control. They want the government to be able to tax. Well, the government can tax. They want they want the government to be able to throw people in jail for violating laws that, that a Congress passes according to certain procedures. Well, that's our situation. So basically, they might carp about the details. They might squabble among themselves of which type of medical care they want or whatever. But the government is in control, and the government has won. It has a, is seen as being legitimate. So they've actually won. They they're getting what they want. You know, the government controls forty percent of the economy. It's heavily regular regulated. There's always debate on political terms. There's always votes. For the next law that's going to be passed, legislation is dominant, etc. So they've actually won, and yet it still bugs the crap out of them that people <laughs> like you and I, who have to pay their taxes, abide by their property tax rules and their property regulations and their business regulations, and send our kids off to their conscription wars, 
we have to do everything they want. We have to abide by their drug laws, by their prescription you know, regulations, everything. And yet, they're still not satisfied. It bugs them that we complain. Right? So they focus their attention on us minor league losers. I mean, we basically lost. And all we're doing is complaining about it. We're complying, but we're complaining. They don't even want us to complain. Now, what does that tell you? There's some kind of gnawing feeling. They know that they're wrong, right? They, And because they're wrong, they don't want to think of themselves as evil people. They think they're on the side of the good, but they know they're not really. And when they hear people like us who are sincere and not hurting anyone, uh, criticizing their basic schema, they go completely crazy. And they want to shut us up. And they become – not intoler- tolerant liberals, but they become intolerant censors. So they want to dominate us with their laws, but they also want us to be forced to shut up and not complain about it. Now, what does that tell you? I mean, I'm telling you, I would switch places with these guys in a second. I would let them be in a in a in a in a museum or history, you know, a museum of communism. They can sit there and give lectures to the students all day long on, you know, this bizarre antiquated view that some people used to have. That's okay with me, but they don't want to make that deal. They want to. They want to dominate us and shut us up. That really says a lot, you know. Especially if you're talking about somebody that's more right wing and they they claim to be a supporter of you know what I'll put this in air quotes free markets and so forth, and yet you say okay, well then why are you offended at a free market in thought when it comes to whether or not we absolutely have to have a state? Uh, it can't can't there be a free market in that and just let the market bear whichever that will eventually and they can't do that they can't they can't play in their mind with the idea that you, that you could abolish the state um, and and still be able to survive they are uh, hyper offended at that and demand that not only that um, that you obey and you pay your taxes and, and but it's just like you're saying they also want your mind they want you to believe what they believe that this is all good and they'll be and really that, angry if they, if you don't yeah and there, you know I'm an ex Randian I mean but there's some things Rand had glimpses of that were brilliant and she saw this holistic desire of this controller mentality they want to snuff out everything you know they're really nihilistic in a sense um they hate it they 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 see a reflection of themselves in us i do believe Mm -hmm. not a reflection but they see they they see we're 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 exposing where they're evil and they just cannot think of themselves that way they're do-gooders right they're tolerant they're liberal-minded and yet they're using the force of the state not only to get their way in terms of law and regulation, but to snuff out dissent even. So they become jackbooted, leather jacket wearing Nazi thugs basically to a certain extent. And that's uncomfortable for someone who has the, a self image of being a tolerant secularist liberal. I mean, look, I'm not religious, Ben, myself, but I think that. Modern traditional religion is sort of a primitive distillment of a lot of uh, common sense, intuitive, moral ideas. That's how it spreads because you have to incorporate that to make it spread. But at least it's natural in a sense. But I view statism and the worship of the state um, and related ideas like environmentalism, etc., scientism… As a type of religion that's even worse than real religion because it's not rooted in any kind of connection to natural norms. You know, it's basically people that have persuaded themselves that they're rational, they're scientific, they're modern, um, and they don't have anything to do with superstitious old religions. And yet their worship of the state is as religious and irrational as anything that they criticize, and even worse. Because at least if you're going to worship God, you know, you could understand that. God is supposed to be a good thing. And you could imagine this hypothetical entity that was good, right? Or at least that you're appealing to or hoping for, or have faith in. But the state, there's no reason to believe the state is God. 
and yet they believe in the state as a god. So to my mind, as a secularist libertarian, I have a lot more uh, patience for religious libertarians of my friends than for the you know the alleged atheist secularists of the, of statism because they're more religious than regular people are and they're more rational and they're more you know collectivist yeah and the level the level of fanaticism uh is, is shocking sometimes. I've known some really fanatical religious people in my life, and and they're kind of uh, it's distasteful to be around them, you know. But when you get somebody who is a status to that level, um, it it's 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 the same fanaticism. It's it's really distasteful to be around them. It just, I you know, I I, I guess that's one of the great successes in my life. Uh, as far as my career and, and retirement and everything is that I've been able to isolate myself on a personal basis from almost uh, everybody who's fanatically religiously statist. And so this, so that's like a great accomplishment to me. On the other hand, you know, I don't go to a lot of parties. I don't go to a lot of events. I don't, I don't do a lot of stuff. So, you know, I, I have to deal with my isolation as the as the result of that. But but still, that fanaticism is just uh, it's just shocking sometimes. Yeah, I would I would almost rather that they just be open open openly admit that they're they're fascists, right? That they're status. Mm-hmm. They're willing to use the force of the state to compel you to do what they think is good. But then they wouldn't have this smug sort of superiority, which is totally undeserved, in my opinion. But um. Yeah, so uh, I think we're in agreement on this issue. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's bring back up your uh, websites here. We've got uh, Kinsella on Liberty. Oh, that's your podcast name. And uh, isn't your website just stephankinsella.com? Yeah, that's that, that's it. I have a, a, an IP sort of devoted one called C4SIF, Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom, C4, the number 4, SIF.org. Which people can use, uh, look at for just, uh, you know, posts and resources focused on the innovation, technology, intellectual property uh, issue. And then you also have Libertarian Papers. I am the uh, founder and executive editor of Libertarian Papers. Matt McCaffrey is the current editor, uh, he's a brilliant PhD. Austrian economic student from Auburn and uh, other places who is the current editor. So yeah, I, I'm the executive editor of Libertarian Papers, which is one of the, one of the few libertarian related uh, scholarly journals out there. And folks, if you, uh, if you want a quicker link to that, get over to badquaker.com. I'll have links today to stephankinsella.com, to liber- libertarianpapers.org, and for the c4sif.org. And I'll also have links in today's show notes where you can download a free version of Against Intellectual Property. And I'll have a link for Amazon if you want to get over and actually buy and have and hold a real hard copy of it. And that's what I would suggest you do, not only because it puts a couple pennies in my pocket for uh, for you clicking on the Amazon link, but also because, like I was saying, uh, against intellectual property, really, I, I just have to push this sales point that it's the kind of a book that you need three or four of them on your shelf. And when you're talking to somebody about these topics, rather than reinvent the wheel, walk over, pick up this little book, hand it to them, and if they can't spend a couple hours at least understanding the basics, then you're wasting your time talking to them. And it's just such a nice little book that is so concise, it defines terms, and it lays it all out in a way that there it just removes confusion from it. Uh, Stefan, again, thanks for coming on Bad Quaker Podcast with me. And as always, you have an open invitation to come back anytime you want. Ben, thanks for having me on very much. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. And folks, be sure and get over to badquaker.com where liberty is our mission. Thank you very much for listening today, folks.